Welcome back, everybody. A few more seconds to go, but uh, being German, I have a reputation to lose on timing. Uh, so let's get started already. Um, here we are again. Uh, I hope you had a great break. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you now the next presenter uh, who has been uh, working with me and I have been working with him for quite a few years in open access and now we meet here again, which is uh, also a great thing to to see. Uh, Curtis Brandy. Curtis is the Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Iowa State University. He oversees collections and open strategies and is active in efforts to transform scholarly communications. Curtis and I share the passion for advancing equitable open access since many years. His remit is also um, publishing integrity and fair pricing. Curtis serves on the organizing committee for the subscribe to open community of practice, which uh, by all means you should know, especially as a publisher and as a librarian working in that field. And he is active with the OA 2020 US Working Group. Um, Curtis will now develop his view on the role institutions and libraries should have in the process of research integrity. Over to you, Curtis, and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Sven, and thanks, Leah, and the Charleston Conference for the chance to be here today to talk about what I um, think is probably the most important pressing issue um, in our scholarly communication publishing space. So very excited to be here talking about publishing integrity from a library perspective. So I have had a lot of conversations over recent months with library colleagues about the paper mill crisis, how bad it is for publishing, how bad it is for research, how bad it is for science and trust, as Mohammed was talking about, and as if we don't have enough trust issues right now in society. So it may come as a bit of a surprise, but the typical librarian view is that libraries don't actually have a huge role when we're talking about research integrity. Research integrity is the responsibility of our colleagues in the research integrity office. It's the responsibility of the folks in the research labs and the research centers who are overseeing that work. And, and I, for the most part, agree with this, but the scale and the damage of the paper mill crisis has really made me change my perspective on this and, and my perspective on what libraries should be doing. Um, I think as librarians consider the role in helping to address the paper mill crisis, this shift in thinking between research integrity and publishing integrity, where I think librarians have a historic role that we have played, I think it really makes it more clear that yes, publishing integrity is something that librarians should be active in in helping uh, maintain and preserve. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna make the case for a more active librarian and library role uh, in publishing integrity. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the higher institution level, but it's mostly gonna be at the library level. And I'm going to apologize. I'm just getting over one heck of a cold. So I hope my, my voice stays with me here. So, so here's my agenda for today. So the paper mill crisis, how bad is it? Why is it happening? And what's being done to fix it? And in terms of what's being done to fix it, I think for librarians to think about what their role could be in helping to preserve publishing integrity, we really need to understand the work that's already being done in the community and by publishers. And I think that'll help us kind of zoom in on where we might be able to put our shoulder to the wheel and have an impact. And towards that end, I'm going to include a lot, I have a lot of links in this presentation for additional information, white papers and reports that people can go out and do a little more digging if they want to learn more. And then I'm going to finish talking about what that library institutional role uh, might actually be. So before I get to how bad it is, I wanted to say a little bit about the context that this is happening in. So I think if I had to sum up the state of the world in 2024 with just one word, I would say uh, divided. 
I think we're farther apart on a range of issues, you know, more so than I have ever seen in my life. We've got autocracy on the rise. We've got war in Europe. We've got war in the Middle East. There's a geopolitical decoupling that's going on, but it's not just like at the country level where we're seeing the, these divisions. It's also in our communities and it's around just a number of really urgent pressing issues, climate change, public health, um, and the list just goes on and on. And what these charts show here is already the trust that in the United States that folks have in their US institutions is headed toward historic lows. And not only that, but from the Pew Research Center, that chart on the right, fewer Americans now say that science has is even having a positive effect on society. So that is the backdrop that the paper mill crisis is unfolding against. Already a distrustful public, already a lot of division, already not a great situation. Um, and I wanted to read this quote, and, and forgive me, it's kind of a long one. So writing in the New York Times in 2021 about the political climate in the US, the decline of local news, this post-truth world that we're living in, the Yale historian Timothy Snyder writes, when we give up on truth, we concede power to those with the wealth and the charisma to create spectacle in its place. Without agreement about some basic facts, citizens cannot form the civil society that would allow them to defend themselves. If we lose the institutions that produce facts that are pertinent to us, then we tend to wallow in attractive abstractions and fictions. Truth defends itself particularly poorly when there's not very much of it around. So science, of course, is one of those fact-chasing, knowledge-creating institutions that can help bring society together around common understandings. As Carl Sagan puts it, science is far from a perfect instrument of knowledge. It's just the best we have. And I'm sure most of us would agree that in a divided, hyper-partisan, post-truth world, we need science and trust in science more than at any other time. So anything that undermines science, that undermines trust in research, it should be considered a grave societal threat. And that may seem overdramatic to, to, to some of you. Um, we are just talking about publishing after all. Um, how bad can the paper mill crisis really be? How big of a risk uh, is it to trust in science? I think one way to consider this is to look at some of the recent headlines. This is what the public is seeing. And I'm just gonna read a, a couple of these. Um, so the one from The Guardian, this one's choice. The situation has become appalling. Fake scientific papers push research credibility to the crisis point. Last year, 10,000 sham papers had to be retracted. And this is, this is the real, the important part here. But, but experts think this is just the tip of the iceberg. So how is that for a headline for eroding trust? We're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And then the one from Nature, how big is science's fake paper problem? Unpublished analysis suggests there are hundreds of thousands of bogus paper mill articles lurking in the literature. So I'm not a media or communication expert, but this kind of coverage, which I should point out is ongoing because the paper mill bad news is still ongoing. Um, this kind of coverage can't be good for trust in science. And I just jumped onto to Twitter or X right before I got on, and the folks at Retraction Watch just shared an article out from Business Insider um, about this. So continuing a slow drip, drip, drip of headlines of this sort. So very much this is still going on and the damage is still being done. <clears throat> So I would say the answer to how bad this is, the paper mill crisis, is that it's very bad. It's a threat to everything that we institutions, libraries, publishers, researchers, funders, that we work on together. It's tarnishing the integrity of all of science. And it's also tarnishing the integrity of all of open access. I think that what we're creating here is doubt around some of the most important work that's being done 
to help address some of those issues that I, those society level issues that I was mentioning around the climate, around public health, around all of the many issues that society is facing right now. So bumper year for retractions, that's our record from last year, mostly coming from the Hindawi retractions. Um, and those Hindawi retractions, as of when I looked at, I don't know who maintains the spreadsheet for the Hindawi retractions, but it's just a wonderful effort. I don't think that Wiley and Hindawi are putting this out, but there's a running list of these, these retractions and it's up to 11,099 as of, as of the 12th. And I put a link into it if those of you wanna follow that and see those numbers, see how high they go. So, so let's talk about why it's happening. And, and I think it's happening because of two deeply misaligned incentives within scholarly publishing that are, uh, have been around for some time. And the first is found in the area of, of research assessment, where researchers continue to be evaluated based on quantitative metrics, like the number of articles, the number of citations. It really is often more about the quantity than the quality. Publishing requirements can put tremendous pressure on researchers, and that's what's creating a market for buying and selling authorship. That's what's giving reason for paper mills to even exist. It's a huge issue. And then the second misaligned incentive, um, which I think is probably more relevant for this, this audience of, of publishers and librarians, is the misaligned incentive around the APC model and publishers chasing profits, short-term profits in particular. The APC-based open access model incentivizes volume. This includes both pure APC uh, models like the Frontiers and Hindawi and, and well, PLOS adds different models now, um, but it also includes the read, read and publish varieties that are also APC-based. So more articles means more APCs, more APCs means more revenue. And with APCs, again, just to emphasize the point, with APCs, we are incentivizing quantity over quality. And the financial incentive for publishers to chase those short-term revenues is powerful, and it leads them to embrace these volume-based tactics like doing special issues. But it's not just the special issues. I think this can also just come in the form of article growth targets that trickle down from the finance team to the editorial team to the research integrity team. And the next thing you know, there are these expectations that, you know, more, 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 and that's the goal. So together, these two incentives have supercharged fraud, and that is coming at the detriment of science, something all of us say we're trying to work together to advance. So what's being done to fix it. So again, back to the, the point of my talk is to make the case for librarians to both care about this and to see that they have a role in addressing it. And for librarians to identify a role in addressing, helping to address the paper mill crisis, they really need to understand what others are already doing. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So this is coming in a you know, from, from publishers to actions in the community, and I'm just gonna run through these. And I got a lot of these, so I'm gonna move a little bit quick here. But starting with some indi individual, front, uh, individual publisher uh, responses. I think publishers, to their credit, have largely recognized the damage that's taking place and have mounted a response. So with Frontiers, what does this look like? Well, in 2023, it looked like a drastic tightening of their publishing integrity efforts, which led to a very dramatic drop in their article output. Um, for Frontiers, it's, they're an APC-based publisher. So when they go from 125,000 articles in 2022 to 90,000 articles in 2023, that's a huge drop in revenue. And lo and behold, in January this year, they announced that they're gonna lay off 600 people. And just as a quick aside, I don't know if it's Frontiers um, communication folks or this STEM publishing site that came up with calling this redundancies, but I think that's kind of a dehumanizing way to refer to laying people off. These are your colleagues, the folks on your team, um, they're more than a redundancy. So change your headlines, um, any communication folks when you're talking about laying people off. Um, but Frontiers, to their credit, um, I was just on a call last week with a couple of folks from Frontiers. And one of the things, just as an example of the types of things that publishers are doing, 
Frontiers is trying to build up the firewall organizationally between the research integrity team and the editorial team. So organizationally, they're splitting out the research integrity team to ensure that independence, which hopefully will lead to better oversight. And you can already see in this quote that they're, that research integrity team is already doing a lot more uh, desk rejections than they were before. So that's some action that Frontiers is doing in response. Next, I wanna talk about the Institute of, of Physics. So, and I'm gonna try and keep to my time. So I've got a script here I'm flipping through. So with Institute of, of Physics, I, I think that the expansion of these research integrity teams, I think that is a common thread running through publisher responses um, to the paper mills. And IOPP is a good example of this. So IOPP had to deal with a significant paper mill issue with its preceding papers. And that led to a spike of retractions for them in 2020 and 2021. You can see that in the numbers on the right. So 2021, 641 retractions, and then that number has dropped drastically. And, and how did they achieve that? Well, they achieved it by tightening up their publishing integrity efforts. They have expanded their research integrity team from one person in 2021 that actually did research integrity and they did DE&I to six full-time research integrity folks working on their team. And then they also boosted the number of folks working on their conference proceeding team so they could do a better job vetting the proposals for these conferences that are coming in. And then the last publisher I wanted to talk about is, is, is Wiley and Hindawi. I think this is the publisher that we're probably most familiar um, with the response, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things here. Um, first, the sunsetting of the Hindawi brand. I just think that is such a significant and telling uh, action for, for Wiley to take. Um, they bought this thing, they lost a tremendous amount of money with it. And here is a brand that they valued highly three years ago. Now they're just gonna abandon the entire name. So when you think about publishers chasing short-term profits at the expense of sustainability and long-term viability of their company, um, and I just had, had a publisher tell me this a couple of weeks ago, and they said, we would never do something in the short term that is going to um, put us at risk for the long term. And I will just say, well, look at Hindawi. They chase the short term to the, to, to the point where they basically have to abandon the brand. It is tarnished so badly. And the con I think there's still conversations that need to be had with the folks at Wiley for all librarians out there is what are they going to do with these Hindawi journals? If they're just going to put a Wiley sticker on them and expect us to roll them into our agreements, I think there's some pretty um, tense conversations that need to be had around that. But now some nice things about Wiley. I think to their credit, Wiley has recognized that this is an existential threat. They have moved really fast. Um, so this white paper that they put out that I'm linking to in the bottom right, this is Wiley's attempt at sharing out what they have learned, the best practices and the lessons in doing industrial scale retractions. And if you haven't read that, I think it's a great read. And then to the left here, this was announced at the London Book Fair. Wiley, and I would put this in the category of making uh, some lemonade out of all of their Hindawi lemons. Uh, part of the work that they have done in trying to clean up their own mess is they built out an AI detection tool and it looks like they're gonna roll it into a product that I'm pretty sure they charge folks for. But it's okay, we can have room in the space for, for profit seek. And if they have built out an AI tool that's gonna to help us address the flood of paper mill papers coming through, um, good for you. You should be sharing it out with folks, with other publishers to use it. So that's some examples of what some publishers are doing, but individually, but publishers are also working together. So I wanted to quickly just mention, if you're not aware of it, the STM Integrity Hub, this is a, a collaborative effort where publishers are sharing data, sharing information, and developing jointly technology solutions to help address uh, the paper mill crisis. And I think it's, it's a fabulous effort. Another joint effort, uh, United to Act. This is a STM and, and COPE project. Um, they had a stakeholder meeting in May. They identified five areas of, of, of action. They're putting together working groups on each one of these. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. But again, another excellent example of the community. Um, and in this one, it, it's a broader, it's not just publishers, it's a broader stakeholder group. 
um, coming together to try and address the 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 issue collaboratively, which I, I do think is just a, a great effort. So moving on to what's happening elsewhere in the community to address the paper mill crisis. Um, Retraction Watch, of course, continues to be an essential project. I mainly wanted to highlight the recent sale of the Retraction Watch database to, to Crossref, which hopefully is going to lead to better communication across the, the, the system. But more to come on that. I think we'll all be eagerly waiting to see what, what Crossref can do with the, with the database. Um, and then PubPeer, you know, which is just a, a fabulous resource for librarians. If you're not getting on PubPeer and watching the conversations, this is the place where sleuths and those who are having questions or issues with particular articles can post them and have a public exchange about any issues that they're seeing with an article. Publishers are monitoring this to see when their, their articles are being discussed. Um, just a fantastic community resource. And then I wanted to mention quickly the work that NISO is doing. Um, I think this is another just super important community initiative. Um, NISO is working to develop recommended practices for communication around retractions. Um, I think as we all know, it's one thing to have a retraction decision made by a publisher and reflected on that publisher's site. It's another thing altogether to see that same retraction notification communicated and delivered across end to end across the, the ecosystem. So that retraction is reflected across every different instance of that article that you might find across aggregator databases and every other place. So I think this work that NISO is doing is key to all of that. So if you want to learn more, there's the link to the NISO work. And then and then on to the sleuths. And I'm not going to say a lot about them, but but thank goodness we have this volunteer group of folks who care enough about science to do what they do. It still amazes me that it's been the volunteer sleuths and it's been Retraction Watch that are really helping to hold the line on integrity for all of us. And I would just like to say publicly, what a remarkable effort to everybody on the slew, everybody who's sleuthing, everybody who's doing this work and posting on PUP here. I mean, hats off to all of you. So now moving to, I mean, still talking about the, the, the community response to the, to the paper mill crisis, now moving to a new initiative. And this is a program out of India that, that is close to launching, if it hasn't launched already, the Research Bounty Program. And what this program is doing is they, they have received funding and they are actually going to pay when you report in a problem paper and that leads to a retraction. Um, and there's some defined criteria. I put the, the website here if you want to find out more about how this is all working. But the general idea is you report the paper, it leads to a retraction, they're going to pay out an Amazon gift card. And why would they do this? Well, they're doing it because they want to incentivize more folks paying attention and helping to do what the sleuths are doing you know, flip over the rocks, see what's hiding under there, get it reported and get the retractions made. More accountability. That's the whole point of these bounty programs. And, and there's two that I know of. I don't know if other folks know of, of more of these. Um, here's the other one, um, the estimating the reliability and robustness of research initiatives. So similar, um, it's, it's offering to pay investigators for discovering errors in the literature. So my guess, if there's not already more of these bounty programs out there, that we probably will see more of them out there because the bounty has the advantage of both incentivizing folks to get in and help clean up what's already been published, but then it's also serving as a, a warning uh, and a deterrent to those who think they can get away with publishing fake or fraudulent results. And I'm thinking of um, Mohammed's comments about the, the panopticon and this idea of, of vigilance and people feeling like they're being uh, scrutinized. But, you know, when I think of like a, an arrangement like a panopticon, I mean, that's really just about instilling self-regulation. And that's what we need in this community. We need researchers to do a better job of self-regulating and realize that people are out there watching. And I think that's something that these bounties can kind of help uh, make crystal clear. 
And I'm not saying I'm, I fully support these. I think they're brand new. I think we're going to learn more how these bounty programs are actually working um, as they, you know, have more time to operate. So, so that was a whirlwind through the community of the response to the paper mill crisis. And, and this is, of course, a, a joke, mission accomplished. No. <laughs> um, I just pulled one example. So this is from, from last week. This is the Elsevier paper uh, that showed up from the journal Surfaces and Interface, and it has the chat GPT preamble not even buried on page nine of this article. It's the first sentence of the article. Certainly, here is a possible introduction for your topic. And before this, you know, I think last month, you know, we had the, the frontiers had the debacle with the with the AI image of the rat. So when you see these types of things, yeah, I just talked through all the good work the publishers are doing, boosting the research integrity teams, doing all of these things. And so just like in the last six weeks, we've just seen two examples of things come through the pipeline that never should have made it through. And so when you look at that, um, you can't help but wonder if that rat penis image makes it through, if Elsevier is going to publish the preamble from, from ChatGPT, what else is getting published? You know, how many other more sophisticated fakes are out there that are, you know, that are, that are sitting and waiting? And that's why I think there really is um, a role for the library to help out with all of this. I'm just checking my time. I think I'm looking really good here. So, so now moving on to the last part of my talk. So thinking through the library and the institution uh, role here. So I hope at this point, librarians in the audience have a better idea of the scale of the crisis, the causes, the current response, and hopefully are starting to recognize that we need libraries to take on a more active role. Um, Muhammad said it takes a village, right? And librarians are part of the village. So here are some places that I think libraries could consider helping out in the areas of both preventing, you know, more nonsense going forward and helping out with the cleanup that is still necessary. And these ideas are not comprehensive. Um, I will admit a little embarrassedly that publishing integrity, just like Muhammad had mentioned, he said he went and he talked about two or three years ago about research integrity and people weren't too concerned about it. Well, I'm one of those people. It's been just like a wake up call for me over the last six months. So I will admit that this is all in terms of my library trying to figure out what it is that we should be doing. And here are some of the, these are some of the things that we're thinking of. So first of all, with if APC based models are incentivizing quantity over quality and pushing publishers toward high volume approaches like the special issues, then I think libraries that care about publishing integrity and care about um, trust in science, we need to prioritize non APC open access agreement and approaches. And these are just a few examples. There's many more um, subscribe to open. Uh, in the diamond area, Cielo and what Lyricist is doing with OACIP. And then I'm a fan of the, the ACM open model. I think that could be a really viable non-APC model as well. So this is the ESAC chart, chart showing the explosion of open access coming from libraries and institutions making open access agreements. It's not showing the number of agreements, but these almost 900,000 articles all represent agreements between libraries and publishers being made all over the world. And it's very important to me that we've moved past like talking about whether we should be, you know, making a transition to open access to how we're going to make this transition to open access. So again, if your institution cares about publishing integrity, then non-APC approaches are what you should be working towards. And the next time you're sitting down with the publisher to negotiate an open access agreement, and if it's an APC based one, I think you should be asking those hard questions about how they're gonna maintain publishing integrity. So the second idea for 
libraries to get involved with maintaining publishing integrity. And this one to me just seems very obvious now. I, I can't believe we haven't already been doing, but when we enter into an open access agreement, we're contracting for, for some level of publishing services. It's time for the library community to establish publishing integrity requirements that we can start including in our agreement agreements. And these can include some of these things here. And, and this again is not comprehensive. I feel like the community needs to, the library community needs to come together and have a discussion about this. But you know, putting in there the best practices that the publisher will follow in terms of publishing integrity. Do we need audit requirements? Does a third party need to come in and verify that the publisher is actually doing X, Y, and Z in terms of publishing integrity? Um, what happens with APCs from retracted articles? So the Institute of Physics recently announced that they're going to donate the APCs from their retracted articles to Research for Life, which I think is fantastic. I'm not sure Research for Life is the, the, the best destination for those donations. Maybe it is. Maybe these APCs, when the publisher gets something retracted, maybe those APCs are what's going to fund the bounty programs. If these bounty programs prove helpful in maintaining publishing integrity, they're going to need to be funded. Maybe that's where these APCs should go. I certainly don't think a publisher that is not holding the line on publishing integrity should get to keep those APCs that they're getting paid. It's like getting rewarded for bad behavior. None of that is contractual at this point. I don't think any library is talking to publishers at this point about what happens with the APCs from retracted papers. So I think that's a very important one. Library community should come together, figure out what it is that we think should happen with those APCs from retracted papers, and we should start making it, putting it in our agreements. And then the last one is, you know, what are our expectations around reporting and transparency around publishing integrity? So Again, I think this is an obvious area where libraries should come together and start including some of these publishing integrity terms in our agreements. Here's a couple of, of, of easy ones. So COPE, the Community on Publishing Ethics, I didn't talk much about them because I was going to talk about them here. They do fantastic work and they have a tier of membership for institutions. I actually think this is a, a great action item for libraries to to go out on your campus, have a conversation with your research, research integrity office, a conversation with your, with your research office, and join COPE. I think it sends a signal across the campus to the research community on your campus that this is something that you actually care about. So very easy action item I think any library around the world could, could follow up on. And then I mentioned the United to Act working groups. Um, I don't believe these are all fully filled at this point. I could be wrong. Um, but if you're interested in participating with the United to Act initiative and you want to try and volunteer for one of these working groups, there's their website and you can take a look there. And then it's still in the area of prevention here, um, the perennial topic of, of research assessment reform. Um, I think we all know we need to change the incentive structure for research. Institutions are going to have a big role with this. Um, I'm not going to say much about it. I wanted to mention the Helios Open Initiative in the US. I think they've been doing a lot of great work in this space. And then I also just wanted to mention open science because I do think open science methods lead to transparency, um, lead to better science, lead to reproducibility. I think folks who are pre-registering their studies, that are sharing their data, that are sharing their methods, you know, th that just eradicates so many of the problems. You know, if th those were the requirements that we held researchers to, it could in one fell swoop do away with a lot of the fake fraudulent stuff that's going on. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we have just finished up the year of open science in the United States. And the Center for Open Science, if you're not exhausted by uh, the in-between conference on Thursday and Friday, they're hosting the end of the year of open science culminating conference. And it looks fantastic on Thursday and Friday. So there's a link to that. <clears throat> so moving on to cleanup. I believe there's a there's a librarian role in helping to identify fake papers. So this is the role of the librarian is a sleuth. Maybe even the librarian is a bounty hunter. Um, I don't think this is a reach. 
I think some librarians might think that, you know, lacking, you know, subject level expertise would make it difficult for them to go in and identify the problems. But I wanted to include a link to this interview with David Blemler because David in this article talks about how he identified a whole bunch of problematic papers coming from a paper mill. And the bogus reference sections, this is work any librarian could have done. And thank goodness David did it. But it just goes to show that when, if you think about a spectrum of, of articles, at one end are the fake paper mill, fraudulent, you know, AI rat penis, chat GPT trash. At the other end is the best science. There's some large number of articles that are out there in the literature right now that I think librarians would be well equipped to work as sleuth, to help identify. And if we get these bounty programs set up, maybe even earn a few Amazon gift cards along the way. So there's another seed to plant. If you have some time, you're interested, you're already in the literature librarians, help do some cleanup. I think it'd be very helpful. And then just the last one here, the idea of this end-to-end -end retraction workflow. Um, I think librarians should take an active role in the work that NISO is doing. I think we're very well positioned to help develop and ensure that we have uh, a system in place where retracted papers um, are notified and the, the changes and the notices that need to happen go end-to-end. -end. So across all those aggregator databases, across all the places where our users uh, may find them. So, so summing up, the paper mill crisis is a huge issue. We all should care about it. It should be something that librarians can help out with. And here are a bunch of ideas where you can actually can get involved. So that's it for me. And thank you very much. Thanks so much, Curtis. I was uh, sure you would use this uh, presentation for activism. Uh, that's uh, that's great. Thanks so much. Um, we already have some questions coming in. Before we get to them, and please let them uh, flow, I have one question for you, one idea for you about uh, publishing integrity and how would you put a price tag to an article that, um, or the process of um, um, publishing integrity. Is that something where you feel because you are thinking in economic models and you have mentioned economic models multiple times? So would it help to put a price tag like um, Coalition S, for example, does as far as I know, and other initiatives to make this more a highlight um, of negotiations between librarians and publishers? That's an interesting question, Sven, and I don't I don't have the answer for it. When I think of the work, the transparency work the Plan S has done, I think it's all been fantastic. It's led to a lot of awareness. When I think of that transparency pricing spreadsheet that they put together, you know, it, it makes my head hurt. And so I think if we're going to have a line item for publishing integrity, it needs to be done in a very simple way that everyone can understand. I think it's a it's a it's a price of of business. I think what institutions are already paying into the system. If you look at the surpluses that are being pulled out of the system, if you look at the profits that are being pulled out of the system, my assumption is the money's already there to do this and to do it do it well. I think if we change up the incentives so we're not getting such a flood of fake papers and fraudulent activities, it won't be so it won't be so expensive to actually do this work, and. I was kind of poking a little bit. Sorry, sorry to jump in, um, but Curtis, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean putting an additional price tag on it to increase prices, but rather splitting. I'm a librarian, Sven. You start talking about prices, I just think you're. No, 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 no. Up, up, up. Um, um, uh, so, but but rather splitting it out. I think that's the idea of coalition, as as far as I understand this uh, last price bucket um, to to look to look at those items. So, do you think that would be? Uh, let me put it that way. Would this be a kind of decision making a factor in your decision making as a librarian if you would um, support acquire whatever a certain portfolio? If you would know that this publisher, this initiative, whatever, invest this amount uh, into research integrity because right now you don't know. Now it's in transparency. Yeah, I think we need transparency around that. You know, when we look at where we're gonna do our open investments, you know, we want to know that, you know, the 
the equity piece is there. We want to know that the publishing integrity piece is there. We want to know that there's efficiency there. We want to know that the publisher is actually um, not charging. You know, we want we want fair pricing, right? And we want publishing services that reflect the values and the things that we care about. So yes, give us some more transparency around publishing. And I don't think there's been enough talk about that. Like if I would not have exchanged emails with, with Miriam at, at Institute of Physics, I would not have known that they grew their research integrity team from one to six. If I had not been on a call with the folks from Frontiers, I would not have known that they're putting up that firewall and organizationally trying to give the research integrity team you know, some separation from the editorial side. I don't think all of that is visible at all. So yes, let's make it more transparent. How we tie that to the cost, I, I, that's less clear to me because it's so new. Okay, um, and uh, Kabi Bazagan um, has exactly uh, one question that links to this, which is about uh, the speed of retractions. So obviously we have increased the speed of publications quite significantly over the last 10 or so years. Um, that doesn't seem to be um, the case for retractions. So Kabi writes, great to see the bounty programs, but sometimes it takes years for publishers to retract papers. How can we speed up this process for the benefit of, of all? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, there's a lot to be learned from what Wiley just did with Hindawi, right? They just retracted 11,000 papers in record time. I think when they are feeling public scrutiny and, and embarrassment, didn't take long for that Frontiers rat image paper to get you know scrutinized. I actually think so much attention is being paid to this now, it's gonna be harder for publishers just to sit on these issues. It's it's not perfect. I don't know what this, the silver bullet here is besides publicly public accountability, making sure that if there's more people paying attention, more people talking about it on social media, it just feels like it needs to be public pressure to make publishers do the right thing. I also think this is where contractually in a library's agreement, maybe that's one of the things that we actually put in, maybe that's a term, that there is a defined window. When there is a public notification that there's a problem with the paper, the publisher has X amount of time in order to do X, Y, and Z. That could be another angle to take. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a question from uh, a lot longer one um, from Jason De Boer. Um, Curtis, many thanks for your great talk. Agree 100% on the good incentives driving this behavior. We need a multifaceted and community driven approach to tackling this. But what is your view on the use of technology to support integrity checks, for instance, upstream before an uh, author submits to a journal? A number of technology vendors are developing tools in this space, uh, albeit uh, with different nuances and commercial models. Full disclosure, I'm working for Creadox, uh, which is one of those technology providers and whose focus is on trying to support the good actors with automated checks, whilst also increasing transparency on potential malpractice by bad actors by highlighting multiple errors and corrections before they submit. I am not an expert on the technology side of this, but I think that the paper mills and the bad actors are going to be using the technology. And so there needs to be a technology solution on the side of publishing integrity. And I think, you know, when we talk about paper mills, you know, those those articles are not necessarily coming from, well, they're not, they're not coming from the United States primarily. They're coming from China, they're coming from, from India, they're coming from parts of the world where maybe the solution Jason's talking about, maybe the institutions that are actually seeing a lot of this paper mill type fraudulent activity, having a technology where there can be a pre-submission screen at the institution level before it gets out the door, maybe that is something to consider. And this is one where librarians are, you know, thinking in terms of publishing integrity instead of research integrity office. To me, this is a question like at Iowa State, this would be a question for our VPR office, our research office, and our, our research integrity officer. But I absolutely think that, and, you know, we are not going to be seeing, you know, just obvious images and chat GPT things included. Going forward, like the, the, the AI is going to make these fakes so much more sophisticated 
then we're going to have to have advanced AI technology in order to help screen out the more sophisticated fraudulent papers that are coming our way. So absolutely, the technology is going to be a big part of, of, of the solution here. Um, I have one last question for you because we are up on time, which is um, let's not forget that all these paper mills are being used by researchers. What do we need to do on the, as you called it, uh, deterrence front towards researchers to even try to use these paper mills? Uh, what's your view on that? Yeah, you know, again, you know, the, the papers are coming from certain parts of the country that are, you know, uh, behaving in certain ways. And a lot of the paper mills, apparently, the articles are coming from you know, clinical folks in China working at hospitals who don't have, you know, time to even do the research, and yet they're required to have publications. And I think that things like that, where we're requiring just a number that somebody just produces something, it doesn't have to be good. To me, that's like a, an institutional conversation. And I, again, I think the public accountability for this, the public shaming is like, and education, it's not all about shaming. It's really about education. Um, really needs to happen. So I, I would I would end with that. And I would also just say, you know, those those folks who are some of those researchers, you know, like the our anonymous person who didn't come today. I actually have a lot of sympathy for them, Sven. I think some of these folks are put in very difficult situations where buying an authorship could mean keeping their job, paying their rent, and it's it's a difficult situation to be in. And so I think we should also all maybe try and reserve some of our judgment and have a little compassion for the folks who are putting really dif really difficult situations in in countries and contexts that we're not fully aware of. Yeah, that was exactly my intention with that anonymous person because I wanted to make sure that we don't uh, criminalize uh, the person who is not in the room, but understand the incentives. Uh, we yeah. understand, and, and you have highlighted that, that there are misalignments uh, in other parts of the ecosystem right now as well, which lead to um, difficult uh, situations for the ecosystem as a whole. So, um, yeah, but anyhow, um, they didn't come. Um, you did. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, that was a great presentation. Thanks for your perspective and bringing the library in um, um, and the institutions, obviously. Um, we are taking another break of 13 minutes, either for coffee, which I hope you all take, and not your emails, but we'll be back on the top of the hour. Thanks again, Curtis. And Thanks, Ben. Thanks.